Hello. How's it going, guys? I'm so excited to be here at my very first National Book Festival. I've been writing the School for Good and Evil series for 10 years. It's part of my bigger kind of alternate Disney fairy tale universe called Ever Never World that I'm building to try to take fairy tales back from Disney, and I'm going to ruin some Disney fairy tales for you here today. But before we start, uh, the School for Good and Evil series is six books. The first book is being turned into a movie by Netflix that comes out on October 19th one of the biggest movies Netflix has ever made. I'm going to show you a trailer for it in a bit. If you know nothing about the School for Good and Evil series, here's a little primer about the series and the world of the School for Good and Evil in general. First one leaves me on a complete cliffhanger. By the end of it, I was ready to drive down to the store that night so that I could pick up the second one. This book completely turned everything on its head. I really, really, really loved it. It was just so fast paced, so entertaining. The School for Good and Evil. I am so flipping pumped. The best books I have ever read. If there isn't a second book, I'm going to find the author and strengthen him. Give me more books! <laughs> I love that thing. The School for Good and Evil is a low-key empire. I get why Sophie wants to go to the School for Good. It was shining and there's a rainbow over there. It's like a dream. Tetris offends the people he loves. He puts their needs before his needs. It's so cool. And there's a character for anybody. Someone in these books is just like you. My favorite scene is when Agatha and when cry. Professor W tells her how beautiful she is, that every middle school girl can relate to. As an adult, it was very weird to feel so seen for the first time. It's just a book that helps to explain what we see in the world. Find your tribe. That's the whole message of these books. Find your personal ever after, whatever that may be, no judgment. And it's the question at the end of the day that I'm trying to get to the bottom of, what connects every kid? What connects every one of us? There's movies? <laughs> and indeed, there's movies coming out on October 19th from Netflix. Here's a look at the first teaser poster that came out earlier this summer and the new one uh, with the stars of the movie, Charlize Theron plays Lady Lesso, Dean of the School for Evil. Carrie Washington plays Professor Dovey, Dean of the School for Good. And then you have our Sophie and Agatha, the two girls who are kidnapped to the School for Good and Evil, one to become a princess, one to become a witch. Everyone is sure that the blonde is going to go to the School for Good, and uh, the girl on the bottom is going to go to the School for Evil because she lives in a graveyard and everyone thinks she's a witch. And of course, they get switched into the wrong schools, and that's why they're in the wrong school uniforms. I'm going to give you a sneak peek at the movie trailer uh, that came out for The School for Good and Evil. Take a look. Comes out October 19th on Netflix. Here we go. Did you ever wonder where every great fairy tale begins? Where the good become heroes and the evil become villains? Welcome. We've been expecting you. What was that? This is it! This is real! So you're going to get your, your look at the movie on October 19th when it comes to Netflix. And of course, we're here to talk about the books and how the books began. Uh, this is the cast of the movie uh, that's going to be showing up on Netflix. Everyone who plays the students and the teachers. Uh, I, was, she, she I was on set in Belfast 
with all the different actors. That's the kid who plays Hort and his famous frog pajamas, for those of you who know the series. But let's talk about how I came to write the books in the first place. And this all started uh, because I thought when I was young I was going to be a pro tennis player. That was my dream in life. How many of you kids play any kind of sport? How many of you think you're going to be a pro in the sport that you play? Where are, my, where are my basketball players? Any basketball players? Raise your hand. Where are my baseball players? Any baseball players? Soccer players? Oh, a lot of soccer players. So I was a big tennis kid. If you, any of you play any sport with any sort of seriousness, you know how important it is to you. I used to play tennis three or four hours a day. I used to go to tournaments on weekends all around the country, and I was pretty sure I was going to be the next Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal. I didn't care about anything else but tennis, maybe doing a little bit of homework here and there, and of course, the 20 minutes of TV or so that I got to watch before bed. Now, my TV was not like your TV. It did not have cable or internet or Minecraft or Roblox or Fortnite or all the fun things all kids like to do. My TV played two channels. One was broken and the other one was the news. And we used to complain to my parents all the time, if we don't have a Nintendo, our lives are going to be ruined. Please get us a Nintendo. Please get us a PlayStation. Please get us something because we are not normal American children unless we have a video game system. My parents thought video games were the devil. How many of you have parents who think video games are the worst thing and don't let you play them? Okay, you know my pain. My parents were so kind of insane that they even thought that they wouldn't let us put like hair gel in our hair because they thought it had chemicals that would go into our brain and then we'd get bad grades and that would be the end of everything, right? So we complained to our parents, please get us a video game system, but they didn't listen. But who's there to rescue you when your parents bomb? Grandparents, right? So we go to my grandparents and we're like, please, please get us a video game system. This way we'll have something to do. And they're like, oh, these kids, because me and my two brothers, I was maybe eight years old at the time. They were like, they have nothing to do. We have to save them. So we come for Christmas. There's a giant box in their house. We're like, oh my God, we got our video game system. We tear it open for our new Nintendo. Not a Nintendo. My grandparents grew up in India where they learned that if kids need something to do, there's one, only one answer, and that is, Disney movies. So they got us like 35 Disney movies on uh, DVD at the time. And at first we went on strike, refused to watch any of them because we wanted our Nintendo. But at some point you get super bored and you have nothing to do and you pull the first movie out. I think it was Robin Hood and we watched it a hundred times. And then we watched the next movie and the next movie. And before you knew it, I had watched nothing but Disney movies for 10 years of my life. I went to Disney World 65 times. I owned the entire Disney store in my house. I wrote the Disney Corporation a letter when I was 10 years old and said, please let me out of school to run your company because I can do it a lot better than all of you, right? <laughs> so I was the ultimate Disney baby. And only as I got a little older did I realize that there was something very wrong with these movies. And there had to be something wrong with these movies because I was always rooting for the villain to win and the hero to die. And so my parents are like, no, that's because there's something wrong with you. You have a mean streak. You're evil. Your teachers are all like, oh, you're a villain yourself. You have a bad part of your soul. You're a bad kid. There's something wrong with you, right? And I was like, maybe. Or maybe all of you are wrong. And so I started thinking about the fact, having watched these movies hundreds and hundreds of times, that there were many times that the villain should win and the hero should die. And I wanted to prove it to people. So do you want me to prove it to you today? OK. We're going to talk about two movies you love. And I'm going to ruin them both. The first is about this guy in the corner. Who is this guy in the corner? Scar. Scar comes from a movie called Lion King. Lion King is about a cute, cuddly little lion named. And can we agree that Simba is not very smart? Simba falls for every single one of Scar's tricks. He's gullible. He gets his dad sort of swept up in that stampede. He runs away when he's supposed to fight. He's a coward. He never listens to anyone. The only reason he comes back at the end of the movie is because Rafiki tracks him down and literally hits him with a stick and is like, it is time. And he's like, fine, right? That's Simba, right? He doesn't say anything funny or interesting or philosophical or useful during the entire movie. The only reason we know he wants to be king is because he sings a song at the beginning of the movie about how great it would be to be king and boss people around and be a dictator, which sounds a lot like that guy. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have Scar, who's very thoughtful. He's very manipulative. He plots and he plans and he schemes exactly like a successful person in the real world would do. 
And Scar, we know one other thing about Scar. We know that Scar is a plotter and a planner. He's w willing to wait until Mufasa, his mortal enemy, has a child old enough to use against him, right? We also know that Scar will never, ever fight you. No matter what, Scar will never fight you. Why? Because he's scrawny. Anybody could beat Scar in a fight. You could beat Scar in a fight. Your grandmother could beat Scar in a fight. Your grandmother who did not get you a Nintendo, right? They could beat Scar in a fight. So Scar won't fight you. What is he going to do instead? He's going to plot, scheme, do all these things, right? He's going to use the hyenas against you. He's going to build these little armies to protect himself. He'll never touch you. So we get to the end of the movie, and Disney's like, OK, we're done with this movie, and we got to get Simba to win, because we told everyone that Simba's the good guy, and he's cute and cuddly, and will make us a lot of money by selling a lot of toys, because people like cute and cuddly things. So he has to win, and that's the happily ever after. How do we get him to beat Scar? And everybody in the room is silent, because we all know that Scar is the superior character and better at Simba than at anything than Simba, right? There's nothing that Scar isn't as good at than Simba. So someone in the room probably goes, well, Simba is Mufasa's kid. He's really big. We're going to get him to fight Scar, because Scar's not good at fighting, and he'll die if he fights, right? That's an easy way to get Scar to lose and Simba to win. Meanwhile, there's someone like me in the other corner being like, we just spent 90 minutes telling you that Scar will never fight you, right? And so Disney's like, oh, no, what do we do? And they're like, what if we do it really fast? Scar is going to like kick dust in Simba's eye. Simba's going to be like, ah, let's have a fight. And then they're going to go fight, fight, fight. And then we're going to throw Scar over the edge of the cliff. He's going to die. Then we play Circle of Life really fast. And no one will know that we've made Scar fight. And he's a character who never fights. And we'll all think it's a happy ending, right? Which is exactly what happened. And everyone fell for it. And we all think the Lion King ends happily when, to me, the smart, superior character died for absolutely no reason. So that's one of the reasons I thought that I started to have the suspicion that Disney was cheating to make the good guy win. And basically by telling you, this is the good guy, this is the evil guy, good guy's going to win no matter what. Guaranteed, they're always going to win. Something went off in my head. Then came the biggest offender of all. And the biggest offender of all is a movie called The Little Mermaid. How many of you guys have seen The Little Mermaid? Raise your hand. OK, this is going to be fun. Little Mermaid is about, just like Lion King was about a cute, cuddly little lion named Simba, Little Mermaid is about a cute, cuddly little mermaid named Ariel. Ariel's told in the first 30 seconds of the movie, never go to the, in the first 30 seconds of the movie, she goes to the, so we know she's disobedient and doesn't listen to her family and friends and might be a bad person right off the bat, right? Second thing we know is she falls in love with some guy she sees on a boat, doesn't know his name, doesn't know where he comes from. He could be a complete psychopath for all she knows. But she falls in love with him. Why? Because she gets that brain-dead, googly-eyed look that Disney princesses get when they fall in love with someone solely based on what they look like, right? So we know that she judges people entirely based on their looks and therefore is a shallow person, right? So we know she's disobedient, only chooses people to like based on their looks, right? Third thing we know, she goes to the bottom of the ocean, goes to the worst person in the entire kingdom named Ursula, who happens to be her father's mortal enemy. So now we know she's disobedient, shallow, and she's a traitor to her father and her kingdom. This is like you sneaking out of your parents' house at 2 AM on a Friday night to go into the woods surrounding your house to find a traitor to your father to talk to, right? Goes to Ursula, and she's like, hi, I know you don't know me, but I fell in love with some guy I know nothing about, and I need you to get me to legs so I can go up onto the surface so I can stalk him and try to get him to kiss me, right? <laughs> Ursula is like, this girl came into my cave, bothered me. I was sitting here doing nothing. She trespassed into my territory. I was chilling, doing nothing but eating my little people, right, <laughs> and not bothering anyone. And this girl comes in, so I'm going to give her a bad deal. Because if she's going to waste my time, I'm going to waste hers. She has to give me her voice, her soul, her father's soul. And she only has 24 hours to try to get this prince to kiss her with these new legs, right? And Ariel doesn't get a lawyer. She does not negotiate this deal. She signs the contract and is like, fine. So Ursula has done nothing wrong. And yet, the rest of the movie, Ariel spends trying to like evade and scheme against this contract. So she's disobedient, shallow, a traitor, and she tries to get out of a binding agreement she signed legally, right? <laughs> and at the end of the movie, what does Disney do? Disney tells you that Ursula dies for no reason. The prince kills her, even though they've never met. 
Ariel goes off with this guy at the end of the movie, and we all think it's a happy ending, right? We all think it's great. She goes by to her family and friends and goes off with this strange dude that she likes only for his looks, goes back to his ca castle, and this is the part you didn't see. She orders a pepperoni pizza because she's hungry since Disney princesses are not allowed to eat during their movies. And she orders this pizza, and the prince is like, <gasps> why is he so shocked? Because she just talked for the very first time. If you watched The Little Mermaid over 100 times like I did, you realize that Ariel, the prince, has never heard her speak ever. Not in the beginning of the movie, not in the middle of the movie, not at the end of the movie. He marries a girl that he's never heard talk. If you marry someone and you have never heard them talk, don't you think you married them because they don't talk? <laughs> so now you have a girl who's disobedient, shallow, and a traitor married to a guy who only marries girls who don't talk, which sounds like the most villainous pairing in the history of movies. <laughs> so, of course, if you read The Real Little Mermaid, you realize that the original story written by Hans Christian Andersen Ariel is the villain of the story. The Ursula character is the hero. The Ursula character survives. The Ariel character dies, right? And so I went back and read all these original tales and realized that we all grew up with these Disney mishmash stories in our head and decided I'm going to create a new universe where good and evil are in balance. I'm never going to tell you who the good guy is. I'm not going to tell you who the evil guy is. You're going to show up and read it. Every time you read one of my stories, you decide who you think the hero is, who the villain is, and you might be wrong half the time, and half the time your favorite character might die, and I'm sorry, your fault. But <laughs> ultimately, the balance in, and the fun of the story is in not knowing what's going to happen. And that's what should happen in a real fairy tale. It should feel like a real survival guide to life, which is why everything in the School for Good and Evil world feels a little scarier, a little edgier, or more intense than in a Disney movie, because you honestly don't know what's going to happen in the course of a tale. So the story of the School for Good and Evil is very simple. Every four years, two kids get kidnapped to the school, the best kid in town and the worst kid in town. The best kid's going to go to the School for Good to be trained to be a hero, like Jack and the Beanstalk uh, or Cinderella or one of the fairy tale characters. And the worst kid's going to go to the School for Evil to become Captain Hook or you know, the Wicked Queen or something like that. And ultimately, the story is about these two girls who live in a town called Gavaldon. Sophie, who knows she's meant to be kind of a Disney princess. She's beautiful, she's blonde. She believes she's supposed to marry the rich prince and have a castle. And her best friend is a girl named Agatha, who lives in a graveyard all by herself and thinks fairy tales are complete bunk, right? And the two of them get kidnapped, just like everyone predicts. Everyone thinks Agatha is a witch, everyone thinks Sophie's a princess, except they get dropped in the wrong schools. And these best friends have to figure out how to survive this very scary school that's trying to kill them both. Uh, and get home before one of them dies. So just a little bit more about the series. This is what the school looks like. When you saw in the trailer, when they're taken to the school, it looks exactly like this, right? School for uh, evil on the left, school for good on the right, school for good's uh, glass castle. Entire inside of the castle is made out of candy. School for evil is on the left, surrounded by a very scary kind of moat filled with crocodiles. Schoolmaster's tower is in the middle. He kind of looks over both schools. He's supposed to be neutral. You'll see if that's true in the course of the movie. Um, and this is exactly what the world looks like uh, in the movie as well as the book. This is going to be in the book that you get if you get the copy of the first book. Um, and uh, it's in an, it, you'll get the full map. So those are the six books. Hopefully, we're going to be doing six movies. But uh, the first movie takes care of book one um, that is available uh, in the bookstore there. Rise of the School for Good and Evil is kind of a prequel to the series, or if you're not sure you want to commit to six books in the series, you don't want to go on that big, long adventure quite yet, you can start with Rise of the School for Good and Evil, which is about the two schoolmaster brothers who run the school. And they are immortal sorcerers, and they have infinite power. Rian on the right is the good schoolmaster. Rafal on the left is the evil schoolmaster. They have run this school for hundreds of years on one condition which is they retain their immortality and they retain their infinite powers as long as they don't kill each other. So as long as the, the two brothers don't kill each other, they get to rule the school together. And for hundreds of years, they've managed to resist the urge to rule the school for themselves and kill their brother until this book starts and then something bad happens, which you'll see when you start reading it. Here's a quick little video for Rise of the School for Good and Evil.
So the simplest way to think about it is if you're a big reader, you love Harry Potter, you love sort of big, complicated books, start with book one in the series before the movie comes out. If you like to read stuff that's shorter, completely action-packed, and then like a big adrenaline thrill ride, you'll start with Rise of the School for Good and Evil, right? This is about the two brothers, Rafal and Rian, uh, and book one of the School for Good and Evil is about Sophie and Agatha. So you can decide where to start. You can start uh, with either one. Um, we're going to do a quick Q&A because I literally have two minutes left. Uh, there's also a YouTube channel, Ever and Ever TV, with all, everything about the movie if you guys love YouTube. And I break down a lot of Disney movies, so you can watch that uh, there on Ever and Ever TV. And then uh, if you want to follow, that's all my stuff. So I can answer maybe two or three questions. Anybody have anything they want to uh, ask? Yeah, tell me. Oh, OK. Have you ever worked any job before you started writing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I got fired from my first three jobs. <laughs> they were all in sort of corporate financial consulting things because I thought I was going to be a businessman and realized I have no talent for that. And the only talent I have is for making up big stories in my head. And I got fired for the same reason from every single one, which is that I was writing fairy tales in the corner. <laughs> so usually, this is what I tell kids. Whatever you do when you're a kid, there's a, a significant chance that's what you're meant to be doing when you're older. So pay attention to the things you're good at when you're a kid. Yeah. Uh, I read the whole series, and I'm wondering, where did you get the inspiration for Sophie and Agatha, and why did you um, put them in this? You read literally 4,000 pages of series. How old are you? Yeah, I'm only 11, and it took me about a year. That so is insane. Um, well, let's give this girl a hand. 4,000 pages for an 11-year-old is amazing. I just felt like I wanted to tell a story of where a princess and a witch come from, because I think princesses and witches actually should be friends and have a lot in common, because neither are particularly happy people. A princess needs a guy in order to complete her, complete her life, according to most fairy tales, and a witch needs to kill someone in order to feel happy. So I feel like they both can't just like sit in a room and chill. They're both like seeking something. So I feel like they actually have a lot in common. There's something, there's a piece missing to each of them. Um, which I find fascinating. So I always thought they'd be good friends. Yeah, tell me. No, no, oh, this one? Yeah, tell me. Excuse me? Uh-oh. I, I, feel, I feel someone about to challenge me. Yes. My name is Ishar Laxina. It's great to meet you. My question is, how did the brothers get their powers? And how did oh. one of them get good powers and the other got evil? Okay, so the pen, there's a pen called the Storian that rules the kind of world of the school for good and evil. And it write, chooses who to tell fairy tales about based on who it thinks deserves a fairy tale. So imagine a pen that sort of looks over everybody here and chooses whose life to sort of tell a fairy tale about. And it chooses who's going to run this school. And ultimately, it decides, instead of picking one schoolmaster, it's going to pick these two brothers, because they really do have split souls. One is pure evil, and one is pure good. Except as you read the story, you start to realize that maybe the pen got something wrong. So yeah. Um, is it hard to like do the books? Is it hard? Hard to write them? Yeah. I don't ever think of it that way. I think of it the same way, just like I love tennis. Like I show up to tennis and I just sort of see what happens and I like focus on the ball. I sit down every day and I'm, when I'm working on the story, I'm just feeling the story in my head. So it never feels like work. It feels hard. It does feel hard, but it never feels like work. It feels fun. Like, do you ever build Lego sets or anything like that? Yeah. Like you know how it's like, it's hard work, but you're loving it. So that's how it is for me. And I think the key to, to when you're getting older, as you get older and older, is to not lose that feeling of being a kid and having fun when you do something. All right, one more. And then they're going to yank me off with a hook. Um, uh, so how did they get um, how did they get to the wrong schools? Oh, that you're going to find out when you see the movie. But that big, scary, bony bird that came rushing through the trees kidnaps whoever it thinks should go to the school on opening night. And so it picks you up, and it's going to fly you exactly where you're supposed to go. Only in this case, it kind of made a mistake. Did it make a mistake? We all have to see if it made a mistake. So take a look. But it was great to meet all of you. Thank you all for coming out. I'm going to be signing in 15 minutes.